Talvez você já tenha ouvido falar, ou pelo menos visto a capa desse livro aqui. Hoje a gente vai conversar com um dos autores dele aqui no meu canal. Olá, galera! Eu sou o Gato Ferreira e hoje é dia de Hello World, esse quadro aqui do meu canal onde eu converso com pessoas notáveis da área de tecnologia mundial. Caso você não tenha visto, eu conversei com Dave Thomas, Andy Hunt. E agora vamos conversar com Thomas H. Corman, um dos autores de um livro chamado Introduction to Algorithms. E cá entre nós, de Introduction não tem nada. Bem, eu pelo menos tive bastante dificuldade quando eu tentei ler esse livro é, alguns anos atrás, quando eu vi ele numa das estantes da Kaelon. Kaelon, caso você não saiba, é uma empresa do Grupo Alura, que foi onde eu comecei dando aulas. De qualquer forma, esse livro é considerado um clássico da área de tecnologia, influenciou muitas pessoas pelo mundo, e aqui no Brasil também. E eu conversei com o Thomas sobre a vida dele, sobre motivação para se envolver com esse projeto, com esse livro, as inspirações dele, e o que é que o Thomas faz hoje em dia. Eu confesso que eu fiquei um pouco intimidado quando o Thomas aceitou meu convite, porque ele foi a primeira pessoa que topou fazer o Hello World. Esse vídeo foi gravado faz um tempo já, você vai ver que meu cenário tava diferente, é, minha cara tava um pouco diferente também. Eu fiquei um pouco intimidado porque, poxa, conversar com uma pessoa da área que escreveu algo tão influente é foda, né? Mas ele se mostrou ser uma pessoa muito simpática e legal. Bom, chega de enrolação, vamos lá para essa conversa. So, first of all, I'd like to tell you that I haven't read your book, but I tried. You no, know, I tried. I, I've been a developer. <laughs> I've been a developer for years, and when I started working for a company called Kaelo, that is a, a school here in, in São Paulo, where I am, we had this small library in our in our office, and your book was there, Introduction to, to Algorithms. And I had already heard of the book. I had already seen it be recommended to developers on Hacker News, Reddit, and Quora, and other online communities. And I said, well, I must read this. And I, I started reading it. In the beginning, I thought very interesting, but there was a part where I, I just, I, I couldn't go further because um, it was difficult to me. I, I, do, I don't have a degree. I started, um, huh. I started uh, studying college here but I haven't finished and I don't know if if that that probably didn't help me very much but anyways I, I know that you are a very influential person in our field and your book is has a, a lot of influence here I I didn't know I don't know if you were if you were aware of this that here in Brazil a lot of people enjoy your work well I know the book was translated into Portuguese by a Brazilian publisher so I'm not too surprised yeah okay so yeah. And, and yeah, I'm sorry that uh, you had trouble with it. It has a lot of math. Yeah. And that, that throws a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing to do, though, is you can read the book and skip over the math and still understand what the algorithms are and how they work. Yeah. You don't have to read the proofs. It's just that, uh, you know, as I think I wrote somewhere on Quora, if you are designing an algorithm and my life is in the hands of that algorithm, I want you to prove that it works. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. So... First of all, Tom, I'd like to, to ask you, um, where were you born? I was born in Manhattan, in New York City. Oh, Manhattan. I have never been in in the U.S., but uh, here in Brazil, we have a lot of influence of American culture. We watch lots of series, movies, so I feel like I know Manhattan, but I've never been there. <laughs> It's it's a it can be a pretty intimidating place. Um, yeah. I didn't spend much time in Manhattan growing up because I grew up on Long Island, which is uh, actually a pretty long island. It's over 100 miles long. Uh, I grew up in a suburban part of New York City, but I did spend time in Manhattan during my high school years because the three summers between my high school years, I worked at my father's printing plant in Midtown Manhattan. So mm -hmm. I. I actually spent quite a bit of time in the city those three summers. And in fact, part of the time I was doing deliveries, not driving a truck, hand deliveries. So I was taking the New York subway all over the place, walking all over the place. So I actually got to see a good slice of Manhattan. So you said it was a, a printing plant? I, I'm not sure if I know what it is. Anyways, so my father was a printer. He uh, did offset printing, the, the term is lithographer, and he was a commercial lithographer. So people didn't just come in off the street and have something printed. He printed things for, for commercial accounts. And actually a lot of his printing was done for other lithographers. Uh, they would have something that they just couldn't do and, and his plant could do it. Oh, okay. And how old were you when you worked with him? Uh, that would have been, I was 15, 16 and 17. It was, uh, when, when was that? 
That would be 1972, 73, 74. Yeah, a little bit after that, you, you, you started studying in college already because right. nowadays things are very different when you talk about tech, right? When you talk about studying oh, tech. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And it, it was very different back then. When was your first, the first time you, you, you saw a computer, you used a computer? The first time I used a computer was in my high school. My high school actually had a computer, an IBM 1130 with 8K of core memory, actual magnetic cores. I have a uh, memory just like that in my office on campus. It's a four by four foot panel. You can see the indi individual 65,536 little magnetic cores on it. I wrote code in Fortran uh, in high school in 1973. Uh, I wrote a couple of big programs, one to divide polynomials. I don't know why I wanted to do that, but somehow I thought that was important or interesting. And then a program to simulate baseball, a baseball game, and that did not fit in the 8K of core memory. The system tried to overlay code, but it just would not fit. And the way that uh, input and output worked was that I would sit at a key punch, type a bunch of cards, feed the cards into a hopper, and output would come out on a line printer. And a year later, when I went to college, it was the same deal. Uh, I'd have to go to a big room with a lot of key punches, make a deck of cards, feed them in, and sometime later, output would come out on a line printer. Why were you writing for training in high school? Was everybody doing that? Was uh, Were you studying that in high school? So at my high school, let's see, some of the kids were writing BASIC. Little did I know I'd become a professor at the school that created BASIC. Okay. Um, some were writing Fortran, and I think there was maybe one other language that people were being taught. But the, the kids who were more advanced were taught Fortran. Okay, so you were one of those kids. Um, Yeah, I was actually the salutatorian of my high school graduating class, meaning that I had the number two GPA um, out of 819 in my graduating class. Cool. Not bragging or anything, just stating. No, that. no, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> But um, how did you decide you were going to, to follow this career? And what was the name of the, the, the course you, you got into college back then? Uh, when I got to college, I went to Princeton, and when I got there, I was pretty sure I was going to study either electrical engineering or computer science. I wasn't 100% sure, but I was pretty sure. And in fact, I almost didn't. I had I, I was an engineer. Uh, that Those were done through the engineering school, and I had to take the prerequisites for engineering. Uh, I'd already placed out of chemistry through the AP exam, but I had to take a, a year of math and a year of physics, and I did not like those courses. I do particularly well. In fact, in the math course, my freshman fall, I got a D on the midterm. And I'd gotten my, a math award in my high school, but I got a D on the midterm in linear algebra. And I just wasn't really very happy with these courses. And the only course that I was liking uh, of the technical courses was the introductory computer science course where I got an A+. But there was one other course I was taking that I really liked, and that was History of China and Japan to 1800. Oh. And I came this close to switching to East Asian studies as my major. But I decided to stick it out and just blow through the prereqs as, as best I could. And you know, so I, I, I did stick with engineering. And I also took an electrical engineering course, the introductory electrical engineering course. And it was nothing like I expected it to be. I thought it was going to be, you know, how do you hook up resistors and capacitors and inductors? To make a circuit because that's what I'd seen was circuits with those elements. It was nothing about that. There was something about resistors. I don't remember anything, anything about capacitors. There. I don't think there was. Certainly nothing about inductors. It was about transforms, Thevenin's theorem, Norton's theorem, Laplace transforms, and it just did not excite me at all. Whereas the computer science course, I understood all of it and I really liked it and and I didn't mind putting in the time you know, we had to do things like compute e to a thousand places and I was such a nerd that I formatted my output which came out on a line printer I formatted my output in the shape of a lowercase e <laughs> so you said that when you you started in college you thought you were going to learn some stuff and you didn't it was something completely different and this is something that uh, i do interview people in one of the podcasts that i we have here in, in aluda and um this you just said that i i got in there thinking i was going to study something it was 
completely different or a little bit different. It's, it's, it's very common. What age were you at this time? Um, so I would have been 18. Okay. Don't you think um, 18 is, uh, is a very... It's... I don't know. I, I felt like a child when I was 18. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I, I didn't feel... Looking at looking back now, I'm, I'm 34 now. I'm like... What was I doing? I had no idea of life and of what I was going to, to study. And did you feel like that too or oh no? No, not really. Once once I decided on computer science, I was committed. Yeah. And you know, I took I took well so at Princeton, at least at the time, I don't know what they do for the curriculum now, but at the time each semester you would take four or five courses and I would take uh, one non technical course and the rest were technical. Either computer science, I did have to take a couple of electrical engineering courses, or math, or I actually took quite a few civil engineering courses. Mm. And I, I can explain about that. Uh, and I actually did very well in the civil engineering courses. I think my, my sophomore spring, I took a civil engineering graduate course and <laughs> did really well in it. But it wasn't civil engineering like how to build bridges. It was about transportation systems using computers in there. Uh, yeah, so once once I started doing the computer science, I was really into it and really committed. Uh, really enjoyed almost all the computer science courses. There were one or two that I didn't like so much. I remember I did not like the operating systems course, but most of them I really liked. Um, I really liked the compiler course. I really liked the theory of computation course. Notice I haven't listed the algorithms course in there. <laughs> and. Uh, what was your your first professional experience? Was during college? Well, by profession, you mean like I got paid to do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would have been the summer after my freshman year. Uh, I was looking for a job at home, around home. So I was, you know, trying to find something on Long Island and not finding anything. Now, who wanted to hire a kid? I had only one course at that point. So who would want to hire me? I did have this one prospect that it turned out it was really good. I did not take. Um, a, guy that I would have been working for turned out to be a crook. And I don't mean like an embezzler. I mean, like uh, he died in hell of gunfire trying to rob a bank. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good thing I didn't take that one. Um, so I went to the professor that I had taken the intro course from, and this is a name that you might recognize, Jeffrey Ullman, who has written a lot of computer science books, including the famous Dragon book, the compiler book, oh, textbook. Oh, I didn't know the book. I didn't remember his name. Yeah. He, he wrote quite a few books. In fact, he wrote the algorithms textbook that I learned from when I took algorithm design and analysis of computer algorithms, A.O. Hopcroft and Ullman. So I went to him and I asked him, do you know of anything on campus? And he said, well, I, I don't have anything, but I heard that Professor Mike Lyon over in transportation program within civil engineering is looking for a programmer. So I went over there at, with Professor Lyon and they hired me. And that's where I spent really all my out of class time for the rest of my time at Princeton. I actually didn't do anything with the electrical engineering and computer science department, except my senior year, I was a TA for a course. But all the other work I did was for the transportation program. So that first summer, we were using the language APL. Gabs, you ever hear of the language APL? Mm, APL, I'm not, I'm not sure. Let me Google it. APL. Okay. <laughs> well, I can tell you about it. Okay, please. So APL stood for A Programming Language. Mm. It was invented by Ken Iverson uh, in the 60s. He was at IBM at the time. APL has its own character set. You had to use a special terminal and special keyboard that would have that character set. It had the, the letters, it had the digits, it had some punctuation, and it had other symbols too that you don't see on a normal keyboard. And in fact, APL has so many symbols that some of them are formed by typing one symbol and then doing a non-deleting backspace and over-striking it with another symbol. And a lot of stuff is built into the language. For example, one of the symbols sorts a vector. Wow. So it's built into the language as an operator. Why? So that's, that's yeah. Well, it's it's very compact. And, and the thing about APL is it's so compact that when you write an APL function, if it takes you more than one line to write it, you feel bad. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to write anything, just one line of code. So it was so much fun to write code yeah. in APL. Um, you know, it was just showing off your programming chops more than anything else. So we were writing code in APL. And then in the middle of that summer, this would have been the summer of 1975, uh, a really cool thing happened. At least cool for, for us, the transportation program. 
There was a big railroad in the northeast of the United States called the Penn Central Railroad, and it had gone bankrupt. It was being reorganized as a whole new system called Conrail, and the federal government was trying to figure out how to organize Conrail, and they hired the Princeton Transportation Program to help out. So I was given the following assignment. I was given several, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of what are called waybills. The waybill says that we're shipping from point A to point B a certain amount of cargo by weight. My job was to take each shipment, route it optimally through the network, through the rail network, and then collect for each piece of track the total amount of weight that went on that piece of track so that you could determine which pieces of track are worth keeping and which pieces of track are not worth keeping, right? If it doesn't carry much cargo, why keep it, yeah. right? So I did that. I made graphical output and that appeared in a congressional report that the transportation program submitted. I still have that in my office on campus. Congressional report with the graphics I made when I was 19, not even 19 yet, probably still 18. So that was really a lot of fun. Uh, so I ended up working in the transportation program really the rest of my time. Uh, my, my summers, all three summers I spent on campus doing programming for the transportation program. And then I think it was my senior year, they decided to open up a programming clinic for people who were writing APL code. And uh, they made me the foreman of the APL clinic. So that was, that was my first job with some responsibility. Cool. And, and after that, uh, or during that, you, you guys started writing the, the algorithms book or it was later? Oh, no, that was much, much, much later. later. That was much, much okay. later. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because this, everything I've said is when I was an undergraduate oh, at Princeton. Okay. okay. After I graduated Princeton, I went to California for six years and worked in and around Silicon Valley. Oh, okay. Where did you work there? What, what kind of work did you, you do there? You did there, sorry. So the, the, the first job I had was at Amdahl Corporation. Gene Amdahl had been the architect of the IBM 360 back in the 1960s. And he left IBM and formed his own company to make mainframe computers that were plug compatible with IBM computers. You could wheel out your IBM 360, wheel in an Amdahl 470, plug it in, same plugs, same instruction set. So it would run the same software. So I worked at Amdahl for a year. I was in charge of the user interface of their internal design automation system. The work was mind numbingly boring, but the people were a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun with people I worked with. They were great, still in touch with one or two of them, but the work was just really not interesting at all. So I left and joined a startup. I went from being employee number 3,750 to employee number six. Wow. And the startup was a lot closer to where I was living. When I first moved out to California, I was living in West San Jose. Uh, and then I moved to a small town in the Santa Cruz mountains near Santa Cruz called Felton, where I shared a house with two people from Amdahl. Um, and then I took this job in Scotts Valley, which was much nearer to where I was living at this startup. And we were also making computer-aided design systems uh, for people who were designing VLSI chips but instead of being in charge of the user interface, I was in charge of the back end of the system. So I stayed there for four and a half years and rose to be their lead designer, but the company was not succeeding. I could see that the company was, was failing, project after project getting canceled, and that was no fun. So in late 1983, I left that company. The company was called Avera. I should say the name, Avera, A-V-E-R-A. I left Avera and took a job in Los Gatos, so back in at the edge of Silicon Valley, at a company called CARE, C-A-E-R-E, -E, and they made optical character recognition systems. They hired me even though I didn't know the first thing about OCR, <laughs> and it showed. <laughs> and, and actually, the first thing I did was a feasibility study. Uh, they, they wanted to know, given the hardware and software they have, there was a particular project they wanted to do, was it feasible? And my, my analysis was no which turned out to mean that they were going to get rid of me. So three months later, they laid me off, uh, which is fine. I did not enjoy yeah. working there at all. By then, I had decided I was going to grad school to get a PhD. But let, let me just ask you something before you say that. Yes, um, yes. How was Silicon Valley back then? Because today we have lots of startups and this uh, yeah. very 
modern lifestyle i'd say uh, lots of uh, hipster dudes and coffees and you know <laughs> how was it back then yeah. That, yeah that's a great question so one of the things I, i tell my students is that there's a big difference between silicon valley now and back then and the difference is back then if you had a programming job in silicon valley it was almost certainly at a company that made some form of hardware and the programming you were doing was in the service of that hardware right now who makes hardware <laughs> well yeah. other companies do but yeah, by and large it's you know calling it silicon valley is now a mis misnomer yeah. right it's really software yeah, valley, yeah. Right? Total. and Yeah, so it's very different. You know, the, the companies I worked at, they all made hardware. And all the programming I did was to run on their hardware and, and on nothing else. So, yeah, it's just very different. There were these places called software houses. I didn't know of any of them except for the Portland group that made compilers. They were out there somewhere, but you know, that, that was unusual. So that's one big difference. Uh, you know, you talk about the hipsters. Yeah, I mean, that hadn't quite happened yet. It was still, you know, pretty much the the nerdy engineers, the nerdy, awkward engineers, not the hipsters, um, you know, not not quite the restaurant scene that you see now. There were some good places to eat, but you know, not like you see now. It was crowded. Uh, the, you know, there was a lot of traffic, but not like you see now. A lot worse now. It was bad then, but it's a lot yeah, worse now. Yeah. It was an exciting time, but you know, even though th this would have been the late '70s, early '80s, now I knew people who talked about the old days, like when it was really just first getting started in Silicon Valley. So you know, I didn't feel like you know, somebody there at the beginning. Uh, I do now, but you know, at the time, I felt like, well, there are people who've been here for a while already. Uh, another thing I noticed is that there were a lot of places named after what used to be there before they took it down and developed it. So there would be uh, like a, a shopping mall called the Prune Yard. Right? Well, I guess there were plum trees there before they took them down and turned it into a mall. So there, there was quite a bit. Yeah, there. cool. Yeah, it's very nice to get this, this perspective because uh, I have no idea how, how it was, but nice. So um, after that, you, you were you were saying that you you decided to get a PhD, right? Yeah, I applied for, to PhD programs in 1983. I actually applied to PhD programs my senior year of college, and I got into the all three that I applied to, but I decided not to go. I, I was burned out on being a student at that point. And one of the places I applied to and got in was MIT. And when I applied to them again, I was not expecting that they would take me again, but they they did. Uh, so yeah, so in 83, I applied to PhD programs. I applied to four of them. I got into three. And it's funny, the one I did not get into was Stanford. Hmm. And the reason that's funny is I mentioned Jeff Ullman before. He had left Princeton in 79 and got, moved over to Stanford. And I drove up to Stanford to meet with him and ask him to write me a recommendation letter, which he agreed to do. And yet the place where he was, was the one place I did <laughs> not get in. <laughs> So uh, uh, when I when I left Care, the company doing OCR, that was in February. I went well, not that I left it. They asked me to leave, and I knew I was going to go to grad school. I didn't know exactly where at the time, but I needed a job for three months to fill in the gap between February and and the summer when when I would move to wherever I'm moving to. So I ended up going back to Avera, the startup. In the three months I'd been gone, they had laid off just about everybody except for the software group. And the person who'd taken over my project had left. They needed someone who knew what I knew for three months and I needed a job for three months. So I went back and it was great. It was great. I had a lot of fun there. I didn't have to lie to them about anything. They knew what I was going to do. And in fact, once I knew I was going to MIT, the president of the company had gone to MIT as an undergraduate. So he was very happy that I was going to MIT. He And gave me a little bonus when I left for the for the final time. Here in Brazil, we we know MIT, but uh, we have no idea how it is to be there, to to study there, and how was it for you? It was simultaneously intimidating and very supportive. I know that seems very a very strange combination. The people there are really really smart. I mean, I I I know for sure that that in the theory of computation group where I 
was, I was definitely in the bottom half, technically. I, there's no question in my mind that I was in the bottom half, technically, within the theory group. And very possibly within the bottom half among all the PhD students in computer science at MIT, technically. Yet, we all really helped each other out. We supported each other. We had a lot of fun together. We played sports together. We had, you know, within our group, we had basketball, uh, soccer, or football, I guess you guys call it. Uh, softball, hockey, we had all these teams in, in the intramural leagues and we had fun names for them. For example, our, our hockey team was called Execution Time. Um, the, uh, the basketball team was called the Hoop Sorts. The soccer team was called the Cold Booters. So I'm still in touch with many of my grad school friends. Um, but also I found most of the faculty to be supportive. There were some faculty who were not. Uh, but most of them were very supportive. So, but I mean, there were people who were incredibly smart. There was, when I got there, there was somebody who was uh, a year ahead of me in grad school. So he was a second year grad student. He was 19. <laughs> and he ended up writing a thesis that really nobody in the world could understand. Wow. It, it combined two areas and you know, there was just nobody at the intersection of those two areas other than him. There was another person who started when I started. And in fact, I was assigned to write scribe notes for a course with him. Johan Hostad. And, you know, at first he didn't impress me that much, but, you know, it turned out he was really, really, really smart. Um, there was another person who started when I started, and I figured, I don't think he's going to make it through. He graduated in half the time it took me. So, you know, there were just really a lot of really smart people, but really a lot of very nice people. And that was great. And also the staff, the, uh, the administrative staff in the lab for computer science was terrific. I'm still in touch with, with some of them. So so in that way, it was really nice. But I mean, the people were really, really smart. And one other thing that I noticed from MIT was that they had a case of, I don't know if they still use this term, um, not invented yeah. here. And OK, so, you know, at MIT, you know, they used LISP because LISP was invented at MIT. So all the AI courses use LISP and some of the other courses. I, I got it into my head, I am not going to learn LISP. I refuse to learn LISP. It was, it became a point of pride for me. And I'll just say it probably would have been a lot easier to get through if I learned LISP. But why, why you didn't, why you didn't watch it? Wasn't I don't know, I just, I guess it was my way of rebelling. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Uh, and, you know, another thing about MIT was it was a shock for my wife and me to move from where we lived in California to where we lived in, in Massachusetts. And, and the reason is in California, we lived in a small cottage in the town of Capitola near Santa Cruz, about a 10 minute walk from a really nice beach. We had a cottage with a little yard and a porch. We had the best bakery in the county right next door. It was it was terrific. When we got to MIT, we were living in a 30-story high-rise for married graduate students. We lived on the 15th floor, and they had corner apartments and middle apartments. We were in the middle, so we didn't get any flow-through ventilation. We were facing right into Kendall Square when four major construction projects were going on right outside our window, including they were redoing the stop for the T, the subway. So the street was ripped open. They were pile driving for the Marriott Hotel before 7 a.m. Didn't matter how late you were up the night before, you were, you were up when they started pile driving. So we did not enjoy our first couple of years in Boston. And another thing that we did that was our mistake was we kept trying to turn it into Santa Cruz. We try to do the things that we enjoyed in Santa Cruz and that just didn't work in Boston. You know, we'd go to the beach, but the beach <laughs> sucked around Boston. And we tried to go hiking around Boston. Hiking sucks around Boston. So eventually we learned, all right, look, if we want to hike, we have to go up to New Hampshire to the White Mountains. Now, it's a longer drive, but much, you know, it's, it's worth it. So just the adjustment uh, from living in a, in a nice little beach town to the, the high rise in the big city. And you know, I didn't even mention about you know, the cockroaches and the rats, you know, just adjusting to all that. So, uh, so there okay, was that. So um, do you think that being around so many smart people um, have helped you to want to be smarter and study more and may have uh, influenced you on starting the book? By the way, I'm saying the book, but you didn't write it alone, right? Yeah. I did not write it alone. No, 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 no. So, so yeah, let me, let me tell you how the book came about. So when I got to MIT, uh, I already had an outside fellowship. I had one from the National Science Foundation. These are graduate fellowships that are good for three years. They don't have to be three consecutive years. You would typically use it in your first year, 
Uh, so what I did was I used it for my first two years. And at MIT, if you did not have a master's degree, you had to get one along the way to your PhD. So my first two years were really doing my master's, which included a thesis. And the advice I got from people was take year three off from your fellowship because you're so burned out from your thesis, you're not going to make progress anyway. Why burn your last year when, when it's not going to do you any good? So I took that advice. So I had to either be a teaching assistant or a research assistant, a TA or an RA. So I was assigned as a TA for MIT's undergraduate algorithms course, uh, which goes by the lyrical name of 6046. Right at MIT, they number everything, buildings, uh, courses, right, everything. And the professor for the course was my advisor, Charles Lyserson. So I was at, uh, actually an extra TA for the course. Normally that course would have had one TA, but I was an extra TA and I was what was called a course development TA. So I wasn't supposed to work with the students that much. It's not that I wasn't allowed to, but my job, my main job was to develop material. And in particular, I would go to the lectures. I would have Charles Lyserson's handwritten lecture notes. And then my job was to write them up using LaTeX, having them ready for the next class. It was a Tuesday, Thursday class. So I had to do two or five days to get it ready for the next class. So that was my main job. I did do some grading. I did do some, uh, some teaching, but mostly writing up the notes. And that was the fall of 1986. At the end of the semester, Charles said to me, you, know, you did a really good job here. How about we turn these into something like a lecture notes in computer science book? So I don't know if you know the publisher Springer Verlag out of Germany, but they have these notes, lecture, uh, these books, lecture notes in computer science. And you know, that sounded good to me. Sure, yeah. you know, a book, why not? So two things happened over the next few months. One was Ron Rivest, was teaching the graduate version of the algorithms course and he started editing the notes as well so that got ron onto the project and then somewhere along the line and i still don't know how this happened it turned from a lecture notes in computer science book into a textbook and i did not realize that the delta between a lecture notes book and a textbook was probably about a factor of five okay but that's what it was so I think for year four, I went back on the fellowship and then it took us three and a half years to finish the book. We started it in fall of 86 and we finally finished it in the spring of 1990. Just kept writing. Where, writing. where did you write it? Back then on the computer, there was a, because if you're going to write a book, you have some oh, yeah. special format and how was it? Yeah, we wrote it in LaTeX and this was before. Uh, there were things like PC, oh no, there were PCs, but I didn't have one and there weren't laptops yet. Yeah. So I wrote it in my office on campus. That's where I did all my writing. That's where Charles and Ron did all their writing in their offices on campus. We had uh, microvaxes, which at the time were pretty good, but not very fast. So to give an example, to compile the book, in other words, to actually typeset it, um, was an overnight run. Unless we used Ron's computer, which was faster, and that was lunch. So start it, go out to lunch, come back, it'll be done. Uh, on the laptop that I'm using right now, 20 seconds. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. So a little, <laughs> little bit different. A little bit different. Yeah, so we did it in LaTeX, but the illustrations uh, were done using MacDraw. I guess it was MacDraw 2 at the time. And this was done on on the, you know, the little Macs, the original little Macs. I, I eventually got a Mac Plus, which had one megabyte of RAM and the illustrations were done on that. And for the first edition, the illustrations had to be printed out separately and literally pasted in by somebody at the publisher. So I had to you know, figure out how much space to leave for each one, indicate on the page what figure goes here and where, and the paste up artist would take and care of that. when you guys finished the book, after three and a half years, you said, right? How, how was it three published? And a half years. Where was it yeah. published? It was it in a, in a media success, success or... So our, our publisher was MIT Press. Uh, we, we spoke with many publishers before signing with MIT Press. There was another publisher that we were really seriously considering. And, and actually one of the publishers we met with was Addison Wesley, which you know, they're very big in computer science. In fact, you know, I mentioned the book by Aho Hockcroft and Ullman, and that was an Addison Wesley book. And the reason I mentioned Addison Wesley is my wife oh. was working there at the time. And we went to Addison Wesley to meet with the editors and they had a conference room up on the top floor right off their cafeteria. So we're walking through the cafeteria to the conference room and I see my wife eat a lunch. 
So we decided not to go with Addison Wesley because they already had a lot of algorithms books. And we wanted to go with a publisher that did not have a lot of algorithms books because we felt like we wanted them to push our book, not yeah. just any algorithms book. So uh, yeah, so it was MIT Press. And another big advantage to MIT Press was, you know, it doesn't get any more local than that. Their office was one short block from my apartment. Anytime I needed to go see the publisher about anything, it was super easy. So so that that was a big plus. And and really the, the, the relationship with MIT Press over the years has just been superb. Um, we've had various editors over the years uh, and just you know, our working with MIT Press has been been great. And I, I, I know they like our book. It's, it's their top selling yeah. thing. So they, they appreciate it too. Yeah. So the book, the original book, the first edition came out in the spring of 1990. Uh, it was pretty well received. Uh, before too long, it was, I think, at 200 universities, mostly in the U.S., but not entirely in the U.S. And I think it was at about 200 by the time I graduated two years later in 1992. Yeah, and I should mention, during those three and a half years, that's all I did was work on the book. I didn't make any progress toward my Ph.D. All I did was work on the book. A good friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, would say, Are you still writing the same book? <laughs> For three and a half years, yeah, yeah. So after releasing the book, and uh, you 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 finished your PhD, right? Yeah, I did eventually finish it. Uh, my thesis was on virtual memory for data parallel computing. So it was about how to how to uh, really how to do algorithms on parallel disks. It was inspired by a paper by Jeff Vitter and Liddy Schreiber uh, that had appeared in Stock one of the big theory conferences. And I just took their model and did some additional uh, some additional research and on it. And, that, and that was really the basis of my research program for many, many and, years. And when you started uh, being a teacher in university, it was long after that, no? So when I graduated in 1992, I went to Dartmouth. So uh, by the time I graduated, I had a job at Dartmouth. Uh, so we moved up here in September of 1992. I finished my thesis. Actually, uh, I defended after I moved here. Uh, a few days after I moved here, I drove back to Boston to defend. And um, yeah, so my first course at Dartmouth was a graduate course, really on my own research. I had four students, but one of them ended oh. up being my first PhD alumnus. Nice. So that worked out. And since then, what have you done? A lot of stuff, I guess. <laughs> Oh, not much in the last 28 years. Uh, what have I done? I'll see. Um, two more editions of Introduction to Algorithms with a fourth edition really all, well along the way. We, it is now, most of it is now in the hands of our copy editor, Julie Sussman, who I, I have to give a shout out to. She is just the best. She is great with the technical stuff. She is great with the writing and she is a real stickler. So uh, Julie has just started working on copy editing. Most of it is still a little bit that we're still working on. Um, and I'm working on the instructor's manual right now, which is huge. The instructor's manual at the moment is almost 700 pages. I think by the time I'm done, it's going to be 800. And it has lecture notes and solutions. And it's not available to you if you're not an instructor who has adopted the book for course use. So don't look for it. Uh, I've taught a bunch of courses. Um, I say 62 or 63 courses um, when I so I'm now semi retired. I'm done teaching and I will be officially retired at the end of the calendar year. So on January 1st, 2022, I am unemployed um, and I gave a last lecture, which anybody can find on YouTube. Just uh, search for Corman last lecture. And there I talked about how many courses I taught. And I forget if it was 62 or 63. And I estimated how many lectures I've given. I think it was like 1,770, something like that. I didn't count. That was just an estimate. Uh, so I've taught quite a bit. And what I'm most proud of in my teaching is that I taught the introductory computer science course 25 times. Most people don't like teaching introductory courses. I <laughs> loved teaching the intro course. Uh, you know, for, for one thing, I just got to know a lot of students that way. And you know, there are a lot of students who I've gotten to know very well over the years, one way or another. I've been to their weddings, um, kept in touch with them. There's one student, uh, she and I have the same birthday. So, you know, we're, we always wish each other happy birthday. We talk about our birthday. Um, so I, you know, I stay in, in touch with a lot of my students. But I also enjoy, uh, for lack of a better term, the evangelism 
of teaching the introductory course, getting people enthused about computer science. There are so many people who take the course not expecting to major in computer science and they take it and they love it and they end up being majors. And that includes a student I just mentioned, but other people too. Um, one of them is a vice president at Google now. Uh, so, so quite a few people. And there are some that go the other way. You now there are some people who are like when I took my electrical engineering course, and it wasn't what I thought. There were some that take the introductory computer science course and maybe they think they're going to be making web pages or games. And no, they're not. Uh, and they're disappointed or that just turns out to be too hard for them. So, you know, there are some who go the other way, but by and large, we gain a lot more students than we lose in the introductory course. And I just really have enjoyed teaching it. Plus, I just enjoyed lecturing in front of a large group. I guess there's um, enough ham in me that I enjoy performing. I had uh, what we call shtick that I would do, you know, just standard jokes and standard routines that I would do year after year. And I just always enjoyed doing that. Another course that I was uh, teaching quite a bit at first, although I haven't taught it now in almost 20 years, was our software design and implementation course, which, um, you know, many schools, uh, they talk about organic chemistry being the course that separates how doctors from the non-doctors and that was the course that that a lot of people would, would drop out of computer science from it was just too much and i was given that course to teach my second term at dartmouth so the winter of 1993 uh, i taught that course and i just revamped it i used my industrial experience in the course i made it so that the course was essentially a big project i assigned the project teams i tried to assign teams that would be balanced in terms of the ability, but also uh, I tried to do things like keep friends apart, figuring that would avoid cliques. And also this way you can only make friends. You're not going to lose friends. Um, but I, but uh, in, you know, in terms of, of industrial experience, I had the students write functional specs and design specs. I gave the, the specs orally and they had to write it all down. And the project was designed so that I knew that they would design really poorly at first. They would over design they would miss the easy way to do it. But I would meet with every team every week and, and guide them toward a much simpler design. But the other thing that I did that was so much fun, I changed <laughs> the specs halfway through the course. And I would do it in a really fun way. So I would make up this fiction that they're working for a company and that the company headquarters was in Republican City, Nebraska. And that's an actual place. There is a Republican City, Nebraska. It's on the banks of the Republican River. I've been there. But that the marketing office was in liberal Kansas another actual place that I've been. And you know, I don't know how much people in Brazil know about US politics, but we'll just say yeah. Republicans yeah. and liberals do not get along very well, right? So I would, I would tell the students, you know, gosh, the people in liberal and the people in Republican city don't necessarily see eye to eye. And I would just leave it at that. Then halfway through the course, I would have a lecture where I knew I didn't have enough material to fill out the time for the lecture. It was a 65 minute time slot and I had maybe 20, 25 minutes of material. So I'd finish that and then I would just start telling stories from my time in industry. I'd do that for a few minutes. And then a student would burst into the room, not a student from the course, a student who I had arranged to do this with. A student would burst into the room and say, I just got off the plane from Republican City. There are changes to the project. And I would argue with the student, no, you can't make changes. They've all been working so hard. And of course, I would lose the argument. And then the student would announce. It looks like you're going to, to miss teaching, right? Yeah. I, 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 what I miss is the students. Um, I don't I actually don't miss conducting a course as much as I thought I would. And that might be because I have something else to keep me occupied, namely this new edition of the book. But I miss the students. I really got to know a lot of them. And you know, it's making me sad that there are students coming into Dartmouth that I don't and, know. And uh, do you write code in your free time? I write code in the service of the book. So I might write some scripts to automate some processes. For example, um, with LaTeX, it tells you when you have a line that's over full. In other words, it's extending into the margin. But a lot of the over full lines that LaTeX tells us about are not problems at all. They're illustrations that it's okay that they're over full. So I wrote a script to just go through the log file from LaTeX and tell me about actual over full boxes. So, you know, things like that. But also a lot of the new material, I write code to verify that it's right. Or I write code, maybe not to verify that it's mm -hmm. right, but to help me generate and, examples. Uh... And And these days, it's all in Python. All the I was going to ask about language. And, okay, Python. So, do, do you have a, a, a favorite yeah. programming language yeah. nowadays, or something like that? Oh, APL. 
but <laughs> but nobody nobody uses it. And I guess I didn't make a clue. You can't read it. It's write only. You can't read APL code. Uh, I mean, these days I, I, I like working in Python. There were issues with teaching Python because you don't declare types. When I'd be sitting with a student, I'd say, you yeah, know, what, what, what type does this variable have? Or what type does this function return? First of all, a lot, half of them wouldn't even yeah. know what I meant by the question. And then the ones who did, they couldn't answer it. They didn't know because it wasn't there in, in the code. That said, I just find I can get a lot of answers very quickly with Python. So when I'm shaking out an algorithm, uh, I typically do it in Python. It just takes me a lot less time to get working code that way. I don't have to compile it. Um, you know, it's, it is nicely polymorphic in the language is pretty orthogonal. So, so that, that works out pretty nicely. Uh, you know, just last night I was, I, I had written some code for the Hungarian algorithm for the assignment problem. And I was working up uh, a counter example to something and it was great. I could just feed it right into the code I wrote. When we were doing previous editions, uh, we weren't using, Py I wasn't using Python yet. So I started using Python in, I think, 2011. We switched our introductory course from Java to Python, so I had to learn Python. So for the previous edition, I was writing in Java or C or C++. And just as an example, uh, I'd written code for uh, binary search trees. We changed how we do binary search trees, how we do deletion from binary search trees in the third edition. And I wrote code to do it. And it was good that I did because I found bugs in, in my, my way of doing it. But by writing the code, I could realize, oh, yeah, that doesn't quite work. So it's really good. Mo just about everything I, I actually coded up. Um, we had Van M. Boas trees in the third edition. I actually coded so, it up. One last question, because I know time is, is ending. What kind of advice do you give to young programmers, beginners that are watching us here right now? So, you know, it's interesting that you ask that. The one thing we didn't discuss was that I directed the Dartmouth College Institute for Writing and Rhetoric for four years. I did that from 2004 to 2008. I was the first director of the institute. Actually, I was the zeroth director. When, while I was the director, they announced my successor as the first director. So I figured, all right, I'm a computer scientist. I'll be the zeroth director. Uh, so I would say what's really important is being able to work with people and communicate with people. It's not so much about communicating with hardware and software as much as wetware, the stuff between ears. So work on your communication skills. Become a clear writer and a clear speaker and also good at, at listening and understanding. And here's why. If you look at the typical career arc of somebody in software, yeah, for a few years, you're going to be primarily writing code. But eventually, your career success will depend not as much on your ability to write code as much as your ability to communicate with people. So that is the advice I would give. Work on I'm that. I'm happy that, I'm happy because that's the kind of advice that I give to people too. Uh, I mean, writing code is very useful. You have to, if you okay. want to be a programmer, you, if you want to have a, a nice career, but communicating with people, writing, speaking is, is a very valuable ability, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh, the next piece of advice I would give is learn some math. And yeah, I don't consider myself that good at math. I, I feel like I'm good enough, but I'm not that good at math. I know so many people who are so much better at math than I am. But you should learn some math. And the reason is, otherwise, what you're going to be doing as a programmer is pretty much just making calls to APIs. Yeah. And that's not that interesting. Yeah. L I, I learn learn some math. Took this advice a long time ago. I didn't learn very much math and I couldn't <laughs> read your book because of that <laughs> okay so I guess I guess I guess thank you it was very nice to talk to you foi muito legal, né, essa conversa com o Thomas. Eu, eu confesso que eu fiquei, assim, é, surpreso, porque eu tava bastante ansioso para trocar essa ideia com ele, achei que eu não fosse conseguir falar. Teve alguns momentos ali que eu fiquei meio travado, mas no fim das contas, deu tudo certo. Bom, e se você curtiu essa conversa com o Thomas, lembre-se que eu tenho aqui outras entrevistas no Hello World até o momento. Dave Thomas e Andy Hunt. Eu vou deixar em algum lugar aqui os links e na descrição também. Beleza? E se você assistiu até aqui é porque você provavelmente curtiu, né? Então, se você curtiu e ainda não é inscrito no canal, se inscreve, deixa aquele like aí pra mim, compartilha esse vídeo com os seus amigos e amigas e deixa um comentário aí também no vídeo, falando o que você achou. Eu te vejo, então, logo mais. Certo, jovem? Vou deixar um vídeo indicado pra você aqui nesse cantinho, tá? E é isso. Tchau!